coming up on Mayo Clinic Q&A. It's really been about being nimble and being flexible and constantly learning, but never have we had to learn as quickly and adjust as quickly as we did during the course of this year. As the COVID-19 pandemic stressed medical institutions this past year, Mayo Clinic in Arizona adapted the care for patients with innovation, such as expanding their virtual visit capabilities. It has, it's validated a lot of our thoughts of what the future should look like for Mayo Clinic and for the transformation of healthcare that we're trying to lead in a patient-centered way. Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic Q&A. I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. The past year has been filled with challenges as the COVID-19 pandemic stressed healthcare systems and even altered the way that we deliver healthcare. But despite the pandemic, progress continues at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona where expansion is underway. Arizona, bold forward, is one of the largest expansion projects in Mayo Clinic history, with investments both in the physical and the technological future of healthcare. The project will double the size of the Mayo Clinic campus in Phoenix. Here with us to discuss this today is Mayo Clinic Arizona CEO, Dr. Rick Gray. Hi, Rick. Thanks for being here. Hi, Helena. Great to be with you. Well, it is so fun. This is one of my favorite parts of my job is to get to have new people on the program and hear about what they do. Obviously, you and I work together, but I haven't had gotten to interview you before. Yeah, it's great to have a chance to do so. Rick, you're a CEO of a large healthcare organization. Tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you get to be where you are today? Well, it's interesting. I don't know how far back you want to go, but I I guess I would start by saying I grew up on a cattle ranch in Michigan, uh, the youngest of seven children and the only boy. So you can wow. psychoanalyze me as to the effect of having <laughs> six older sisters. Uh, but I began at Mayo Clinic really as an intern. I came straight out of medical school and did my surgical training at Mayo Clinic in Arizona. And then as a Mayo Scholar, which is a connection back to Mayo Clinic, I went to the H. Lee Moffitt Cancer Center and did surgical oncology training. So came back to Mayo Clinic as a cancer surgeon and really have had my, have had my career dedicated to breast cancer, melanoma, and soft tissue sarcoma for caring for patients and my research. Also very involved in Mayo Clinic education activities, leading a surgical training program during my time. And as you said, I've also had many wonderful leadership opportunities here at Mayo Clinic within the education realm, within the Department of Surgery, within the Cancer Center, and even had an interesting task as a co-leader of a transformation of our digital environment at Mayo Clinic called the Plumber Project, which changed all of our EHR platforms and was a uh, big undertaking for Mayo Clinic. But as you said, I've now been CEO of Mayo Clinic in Arizona for a little less than two years, and it's been a fabulous experience, although they did promise me no pandemics coming into it. <laughs> well, they were wrong about that. They were. Rick, you kind of embody uh, the three shields of Mayo Clinic, uh, patient care, research, and education. That's really fascinating. Yes, it's, uh, it, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful aspect of being a physician at Mayo Clinic is the ability to be involved across all of those arenas, and, and uh, it just really enhances our experience and is important for doing the right thing for our patients to interconnect all of those aspects. Do you still see patients? I do not. So uh, we have a physician leadership model at Mayo Clinic that really involves having physicians that see patients involved in leadership. And really my position is one of the only exceptions to that. I found that I could see patients, but it would be so limited that it would really only be good for me, not good for the patient, <laughs> for my colleagues. So I, I did give up my practice. Well, that makes sense. Rick, let's take a look back at 2020. When you look back at that pandemic that you just mentioned, how has uh, Mayo Clinic in Arizona navigated all of the changes? It really has been an incredible year, a very challenging year. At Mayo Clinic in Arizona, I really think, uh, like across Mayo Clinic, it's really been about being nimble and being flexible and constantly learning. 
we pride ourselves at Mayo Clinic as being a learning organization. And obviously our scientific basis and educational model help foster that. But never have we had to learn as quickly and adjust as quickly as we did during the course of this year. So in Arizona, we really went through multiple phases beginning with that initial lockdown phase in March and April. And I think that was dominated by uncertainty and even fear. That was then followed by what I'll call a recovery phase where so many people with non-COVID healthcare needs had to have those delayed or deferred. And we needed to catch up and provide that serious or complex care that people count on Mayo Clinic and Mayo Clinic in Arizona for. But then Arizona was caught in that summer surge in the Sun Belt mm. that uh, we all remember back in June, July, and August. And that was a return to limitations on what we could do because of the overwhelming number of COVID patients. And then we went through another recovery phase and then a winter surge. And we've really just emerged from that now. So we're, we're excited to be back in that uh, catch up phase where we can meet more of those serious or complex needs. But it's been incredible to see how nimble and flexible our staff has been during those surge phases there were many days where, for example, our transplant surgeons would be on the phone with our critical care physicians and our surgical services leaders, figuring out hour to hour if we had capacity and critical care to move forward with, say, a liver transplant for a patient in need. And that type of communication and coordination was incredibly important for Mayo Clinic in Arizona to navigate this. Wow, the stories you could tell. So there many are a changes. lot of stories to come out of 2020, that's for sure. So I think I, all of us are hoping in the future, Rick, that we're going to move past this pandemic sometime. It's a little hard to imagine right now. But as we get a few years down the road, road after this, what do you think you will remember the most when you look back at pandemic time? There will be a lot of things to remember. Certainly, as I mentioned, that initial uncertainty and fear of what would this look like? What would it mean? What would it mean to keep our staff and patients safe? I think that will be a memory that all of us will carry forward from it. But as you said, as we get a little further out, I do think that all of the creative solutions and accelerations in healthcare transformation a lot of those pieces will be what we'll carry with us because those will still be a day-to-day -day part of how we're taking care of patients and how we're performing our research and education duties. And if anything, I always say we've learned humility from this, that we don't always know how to predict exactly what's coming our way. And even in the midst of COVID-19, to try to be able to map out what would be the next steps, we could only get so far. And, and those reminders of what we are and are not in control of. And again, that importance of flexibility and making adjustments along the way uh, will be wonderful. But probably the thing right now that I say I, I've taken away most from this is what we've seen in our Mayo Clinic people. And, and it's been incredible. It's been said that uh, you really find out what's inside something if it's bumped hard enough to make its content spill out. And, and <laughs> like COVID-19 bumped us at Mayo Clinic pretty hard. And, and what we've seen spill out has been empathy and bravery and a, and a selflessness to serve our patients and our colleagues that is really inspiring for me. And, and, and that's what I will hold on to for sure. Wow, I think that's wonderful, Rick. I remember back to the beginning of this whole pandemic and I, there were months of just feeling like we had losses. Things were being taken away from us. We were restricted in traveling, in uh, going to work even, in going to the store. There was no toilet paper, et cetera, et cetera. And so I started trying to think of what's good about the pandemic, um, just to remind myself to be grateful. And so I have a few things that I think are good about the pandemic. Uh, one is that I've learned to say no a little bit more and it's been okay. And then I like Zoom. I'm meeting with you on Zoom. Right. I'm wondering, Rick, what do you find good about the pandemic? What will you take out of this as a positive? Well, I do think those lessons learned about how we can make decisions quickly and, and do it in a streamlined way. Um, Mayo Clinic, for those listening, has a long history of 
uh, consensus-based decision-making, which has served us very well in our committee systems and other things. But we learned there are times and there are circumstances where we need to streamline our decision making. So again, we can learn and make those adjustments quickly and deploy those to the people that need them. So I think that learning of how to adjust and simplify and push out decision making will be something good that we can walk away with. And of course, uh, as you know, Helena, very well, even before the pandemic, Mayo Clinic rolled out our 20, road to 2030. Our, yes. our 2030 strategy that we dubbed Bold Forward. And there were aspects of that, such as greatly increasing telehealth services that were just accelerated by the circumstances mm -hmm. of the pandemic. No one would ever wish for an awful pandemic like this that has wreaked so much devastation in order to accomplish those goals. But nonetheless, that is a silver lining for which we can be grateful because everyone saw the benefits of what we were trying to work toward. So I, I could give other examples of our 2030 roadmap that have really been accelerated like hospital at home services and other types of things. So you're right, it's wonderful to focus on what we can be grateful for even in circumstances that are very trying. I think what you just shared is wonderful, Rick, that we had these plans to move forward to certain places. And in some ways, the pandemic has enabled us to do that or even accelerated that. It's really interesting. It has. It's validated a lot of our thoughts of what the future should look like for Mayo Clinic and for the transformation of healthcare that we're trying to lead in a patient-centered way. At the top of the program, I was mentioning all of the expansion and changes that are going on at Mayo Clinic in Arizona. Tell us a little bit about that. How is that progressing during the pandemic and what would patients see when they came to the campus? Well, there's another thing to be grateful for. We at Mayo Clinic in Arizona are grateful that we have been able to stay on track with Arizona Bold Forward. Uh, despite the challenges of the pandemic, we worked closely with our construction partners to keep their workers safe from COVID and have been able to keep it on schedule. And we're now about 25% complete. And as you mentioned at the opening, uh, this is an exciting expansion, 1.6 million square feet that we're adding in all aspects. So we're adding inpatient care, we're adding emergency department and laboratory space, outpatient care areas, and we're expanding our education and research footprints. So this is classic Mayo Clinic uh, undertakings of ensuring that all of our, what we call three shields, practice, research, and education come forward together. But as to what our patients will see, um, I think they'll see a lot of what we were talking about in our 2030 strategy. How is Mayo Clinic moving forward with the transformation of healthcare by blending the physical and digital worlds together in the right balance? Um, of course, they'll see beautiful spaces that are intended to promote healing for our patients and, and comfort and peace for their family members. Um, but they will experience a lot of things through those digital connections that will also just make their life a little bit better and a little more convenient and a little simpler. And we could all stand a lot of simplification within healthcare. But I would be remiss without mentioning that Another important aspect for us is taking care of our staff through mm -hmm. these new spaces. And it was a beautiful thing to see when we held focus groups with our patients and family members as we were planning Arizona Bold Forward and asked, what do you as a patient or family member want to see in all of this? They offered us some wonderful suggestions, but at the end, they kept coming back to please take care of your people. We love coming to Mayo Clinic for the wonderful cutting edge technology and treatment modalities and, and architecture is great and healing atmospheres are important, but we really come here for your amazing people that put together the solutions for us. So please take care of them. And it, and it was wonderful again to see that selflessness from our patients and their families. Isn't that neat, Rick, that even in the midst of patients needing to go through medical care, they're still caring about the staff caring for them too. That's really neat. That's great. So Mayo Clinic Arizona excels in many, many areas of practice, Rick. And I'm wondering, can you tell us some of the big highlights uh, from the last year? 
Well, it, it feels like the last year was all about COVID-19, but it wasn't. Yes. Um, COVID-19 certainly challenged us and showed some of the metal of Mayo Clinic and in particular of Mayo Clinic in Arizona. And I should mention actually of all of the top 20 US news hospitals in the US, the honor roll they call it, Mayo Clinic in Arizona cared for the highest percentage of COVID-19 patients last oh, year. Oh, wow. So uh, it, was, it was an incredible challenge, but our people really stepped up to it. And to your point, we're able to provide a lot of amazing things, much more so than just COVID-19. So one of the things we're most proud of in, in 2020 is that Mayo Clinic in Arizona became the number one solid organ transplant program in the nation. That's amazing. Yeah. In Congratulations. Very, thank you. Yeah. In a very challenging year where transplants in the U.S. actually went down by 2%, mm -hmm. in our program, they went up by 6%. So um, that happens through stories like I related earlier of that careful coordination to make sure we can balance all the considerations and a lot of innovations that have made uh, our team three times more likely than other transplant programs to be able to accept an organ and therefore um, the fastest in the nation to move patients from being listed as in need of a tr transplant to actually receiving that gift of life. So lots of breakthroughs uh, in cancer, neurosciences, cardiovascular health, the transplant programs that I talked about, plenty of scientific breakthroughs, both in COVID and non-COVID care. Just again, incredible to see how our people powered through these challenges and tried to make the most of them. Like you said, be, be grateful for, for the pieces we have instead of just focusing on the challenges. Rick, I know that in Arizona, you have something called the MedTech Incubator. What does that mean? Yes. So, we have a program called a, a MedTech Accelerator, a MedTech Incubator, and this is really a partnership between Mayo Clinic and early phase companies that are bringing innovation and especially digital and technological innovation into healthcare. Um, many of these early stage companies have a lot of capabilities and especially technological expertise but not obviously the depth of medical care knowledge or scientific healthcare knowledge that Mayo Clinic possesses. And so we really feel strongly that we can bring together capabilities on behalf of patients and that patient-centered transformation of healthcare that I talked about. And this is in cooperation and coordination with Arizona State University that we are able to bring in these companies, partner with them, accelerate what they're doing while at the same time accelerating what Mayo Clinic is trying to do for the future of healthcare. I think one of the reasons that I wanted to work at Mayo Clinic is that I was so impressed that not only are we attempting to provide absolute excellence in patient care and in education, but we're always trying to think ahead to what the next changes in healthcare might be that would advance that care or make it even better. Absolutely. We, we certainly know that Mayo Clinic has become number one for a reason, but we aren't saying we're number one and therefore we should keep doing things the way we've done. We said we're number one because we continue to innovate. We continue to look for that next new, new solution. And we want to do that as quickly as possible. And things like the MedTech Accelerator and other collaborations can help us to accelerate that even more quickly. Rick, you were talking a little bit about the um, collaborations and partnerships that Mayo Clinic has with Arizona State University and other tech companies. How does that benefit uh, our patients, Mayo Clinic, and um, the other entities? It really does come back to the um, fostering of innovation and having that transformation happen more quickly. If we at Mayo Clinic tried to create every capability that, that is necessary for the, for the transformation of healthcare and where we need to go, it would take us a very long time, a lot of resources, a lot of people. When there are others out there who are mission focused and share our values, who have complementary capabilities that we could come alongside and work together. At Mayo Clinic, we always talk about that our core value is the needs of the patients come first. Mm -hmm. And if we really think that, 
then we're not going to try and do everything ourselves if doing it with others is going to allow us to put the needs of the patients first. And so that's a core part of, of who we are. It goes back to the Mayo brothers and their willingness to collaborate, share their knowledge and learn from others. And we're putting that to practice even now today. I think that's really fascinating that even in the research realm, we uh, collaborate. That's certainly true in clinical medicine. And it's one of the things that most impresses our patients that I can call you when you see a patient or you'll call me and ask them, uh, me to see them. And we can discuss patients uh, in a group setting, different uh, roles. Um, and I think that's great. It's part of our culture, isn't it? Uh, to yes. work together on behalf of the good of the patient. I still remember I was brand new on staff at Mayo Clinic and I saw a patient with a difficult problem and I didn't think it was the problem that she came to see me about. I thought it was a little different. And I walked down the hallway down to another department to someone that I thought might be more related, even though the whole backstory didn't make sense. I just had a feeling it was more in the realm of this expert than I. And when I showed it to him, he said, oh yeah, I just got off the phone talking about my research paper that I published on this exact problem. Let me come down and help you with her right now. And I said, now that is why I want to be at Mayo Clinic. You just described it. That's wonderful. Rick, every one of our institutions, uh, Florida, Arizona, Rochester, our institutions in the Midwest have a lot of uh, different talents, capabilities. How do you think may, um, patients select which Mayo Clinic uh, they should go to for care? Yes, we used to talk a lot about uh, being one Mayo Clinic with three doors. And um, we, we try very hard to make sure that Mayo Clinic is the best place for people to receive multidisciplinary care for serious or complex conditions, no matter where they go. And I think what we were just talking about, Helena, is the key to that. So if a patient comes in our doors in Arizona and has a particular condition that the world's expert happens to be in Rochester, Minnesota or Jacksonville, Florida, we just pick up the phone and make sure that we collaborate and are doing exactly the right thing on behalf of that patient and vice versa. So we have a lot of overlapping expertise, but more importantly, we leverage all of the knowledge of Mayo Clinic. And that's one of the things we wanna to continue to foster moving forward. We, we sometimes joke that sometimes Mayo Clinic doesn't know what Mayo Clinic knows. And so we wanna make sure all of that knowledge and expertise is visible within Mayo Clinic and more and more to the external world. As you know, Helena, a lot of our work is on creating digital platforms that will yes. allow more access to those patients and even other collaborating researchers that need that level of expertise and collaboration and to be able to do it in a, in a broader fashion and in a simplified fashion for patients. You know, I've been particularly impressed. You talked a little bit earlier, Rick, about our electronic health record. And, you know, as a clinician, there is a little bit of me that's an old dog needing to learn new tricks. And it wasn't all that fun uh, at times. However, we now have an electronic health record that I can see the same images and the same clinic reports and lab notes that you can see in Arizona and that can be seen in Florida and in our other sites. And that's really amazing. We used to not, not share that. Between that and video visits, the ability for us to collaborate on patients is just uh, monumental. It really is remarkable and change is always painful, right? Neither you yep. nor I really wanted to learn a different uh, EHR system. And yet we have to change to move forward. And we did it because it's for the benefit of our patients. And I would share another brief anecdote that just two weeks ago, I got a notice that there was a new study that showed a particular uh, drug and medication in the perioperative period is probably not best suited for certain categories of patients. And we were instrumenting across all of Mayo Clinic an instant update to all order sets that contain that medication to assure it was optimally wow. administered to the right patients. And that's an example of what you're talking about, yes. of the power of very quickly spreading Mayo Clinic knowledge and doing it in an automated uh, uh, format 
that more quickly brings our patients to the cutting edge of whatever is best for them. Any last thoughts you'd like to share today, Rick? No, I, you know, I am so privileged to work at Mayo Clinic for all the reasons we've talked about today, but particularly being in this position, I get to see all the amazing work that our people are doing at Mayo Clinic in Arizona and across all of Mayo Clinic. But I know a lot of that work is happening, especially in a stressful year like we've had in many healthcare organizations. So we saw a real outpouring of appreciation for healthcare and other frontline workers um, in 2020. And I hope we can keep up that appreciation because we have such amazing people, especially at Mayo Clinic, I may be a little biased, but all across the country and all across the world that are, that are doing wonderful work. So I just always want to keep in mind how grateful, speaking of gratitude, we should be to all of the people that are, that are doing this work day in and day out. It can be hard, but it's fulfilling and they do um, God's work really. That's right. Hats off to healthcare workers everywhere. That's, That's right. Wonderful. Thanks, Rick, for being here. Thank you, Helena. Our thanks to Dr. Rick Gray, CEO of the Mayo Clinic in Arizona, for being with us today on Q&A to share about the work being done there. I hope that you learned something. I know that I did. We wish you a wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.